got to put that thing right back. Gordon and I go way back, way, way back, way, way back. Way, way. He'll leave that, leave that to another. Okay, so here's what's going on. You've got your material ground in a canister. The canister went into the extraction system. Bill Cameron set up the parameters, and we're going to go in, and you're going to you're going to run the extraction. Cool. So come on in. This is our SCFN Dual 7 extraction system. It's seven liter vessels with five liter canisters. So we loaded a five liter canister with some of your material uh, into E1, and that's extractor number one. Um, the system is runs on recipes, so the recipe has been loaded into the system. The parameters we want to use in that recipe have been entered into the system. Now you're the operator, and we're going to have you run this. So I want you to come over here, and I want you to press that start button. But hold your finger on it for a couple of seconds. Just, just a couple of seconds. Good. All right. Excellent. So it's up and running. This is doing its home. Okay. Now it's waiting to load the CO2. It's waiting for the set point pressure. So it's starting to build pressure. You can hear the pump starting to run. And here. That's the set point pressure, and that's the actual pressure. And we're going to let this just gonna take a few minutes. Overall control system, I'll walk through it later, but you can see the different right. screens have different purposes. The machine screen kind of gives you an overall overview of the machines, how you start and stop. The layout is the one you saw before, right. um, the synoptic layout, and it shows you exactly what's going on in the system, all the sensor points and all the control points you can access directly. Then the manual function allows you to add, enter parameters and do other things of uh, manual type of functions. Option, right, there are a variety of options you can do. Production is for keeping track of your manufacturing. So, for instance, if you were going to do 72 lots of hemp or 15 lots of uh, uh, some guy walker, right? right. Uh, you put that in and as it runs down, this might run, will run over multi-shifts so that it keeps records and so that it won't overrun the, the, the order. Uh, alarms show you the status of the machine and any problems that are going on with the machine. The recipes is where you, where you load and enter recipes. You can have an unlimited number of recipes. So if you have a specific process that you want to run for Skywalker, what are we running today, by the way? This is uh, White Widow. Okay. So if you have a specific process that you found or we found, we'll write White Widow, and we're going to do it over and over again, we'll, we'll create a White Widow recipe. In this case, the, the main parameters that we're trying to control, first of all, is temperature, then pressure, and flow. And all of those, um, there's an extra element, which is time. The flow and the time are related, all right? But the time determines a lot how long you run it, for instance, or how long you run it a particular way for how long. Um, the system starts off, uh, on the other side of the wall, we have bottles of CO2, okay? Those bottles of CO2 are tied into to the, the, the traction system. Um, through this pipe, right, and then down through this automatic valve. And you see there's a pressure transducer, there's an automatic valve. Uh, and over here we have a level sensor. Uh, most extraction systems don't have level sensors. In fact, I think we're the only one we know that actually does, does it quite this way. We want to know what the level of CO2 is in the, the, the vessel because we want to be sure that we have room to move the material through the system the way we want it. And because the kinematics of the system, that's the energy in and the energy out, uh, needs to stay in balance. And how the system runs will be different if it's got almost no CO2 in versus a lot of CO2 because it'll have more or less of a mass that the system is trying to heat and cool. It's totally closed with closed loop um, and four-way. By closed loop, I mean it knows what its temperature is 
and it, it knows what you want the temperature to be in its closed loop so that it will eventually get that temperature to that point you want it to hold. You know, same thing with pressure, all right? And so the pressure is also closed, okay? Flow rate is closed loop. We have a, a Coriolis flow meter, which gives us the mass flow of the of the CO2 that's traveling through the system. And that will match up with the control. Now, because each thing affects the other, if you change the temperature, you'll change the pressure and you'll change the flow. If you change the flow, you'll change the temperature and you'll change the pressure. Well, how do you keep that in control? That's very, very difficult, um, but it's very, very important. We add the CO2 level as the fourth uh, closed loop control part of the system um, because we want to keep those, that those kinematics, the energy in, the energy out, consistent, run through run, because we want to get repeatable results. This pump is, this pump is beautiful. The company, German, have been making pumps for 60 some odd years, I think 62 years. Um, it's a diaphragm dosing pump. It's extremely accurate. Um, and it's designed so that uh, it keeps the all of the pump lubricants isolated from the CO2 that we're pumping on that. And it does that with a double Teflon diaphragm. Uh, this is a variable speed motor. There's a yoke, which allows us to adjust the stroke of the piston. That, that yoke drives the piston back and forth. And by varying this, we can determine just what that, that, that stroke is. Every time that piston goes forward, it goes through a set of seals, uh, actually, the piston head is here, but the, it, it displaces the uh, food grade mineral oil that's in the pump head, and that displaces the diaphragm. Okay? And then when the pump goes back, it, it, it sucks the diaphragm back, it sucks up material into the head, and when the piston comes forward, it sh shuts that, it builds pressure, shuts that, and then the, the CO2 comes out of here. Okay? So that's how we get pumping action. Uh, the pump is a, is a marvel that has a mean time to failure of 20,000 hours if you're in it, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. After the CO2 comes out, it goes through this Coriolis flow meter. Coriolis flow meter is an interesting thing. It has these two loops opposite each other that look like the letter omega. And as the flow goes through those loops, it changes how those uh, loops want to move. By measuring that movement, it's able to calculate what the mass flow is going through, through the, the meter. We put the mass flow on the high pressure side of the pump. Because over here, right now we're pumping over 4,000 psi, and going into the pump is maybe 1,000 psi. Today we're doing a co-solid extraction, so to modify the process. Uh, some people would call it expanded ethanol. Uh, some people call it CO2 expanded ethanol. But we're going to pump ethanol in along with the CO2 because the combination of the two creates a super solid. Right? And our objective today is to do the truest, richest, most productive full spectrum extract. Uh, when the CO2 comes through and is joined by the ethanol, it then goes into this big heat exchanger and a heat source on the other side of the wall, uh, we call a heater, some people call a boiler, will raise the temperature of that CO2 to the temperature that we want. And the temperature that we want is uh, greater than 31 degrees C because above 31 degrees C, the uh, CO2, which was in the liquid form coming to here, right. gets heated up and it becomes supercritical. Okay. To be supercritical though, it really needs to also have a pressure um, that's above 78 bar, right, which is about 1,080 PSI. So that combination makes the CO2 supercritical. We're trying to get out the non-polar compounds with the CO2, the, the less non-polar to moderately polar compounds with the ethanol. Right? Okay. 
once the CO2 comes through the heat exchanger, it's at the temperature and pressure we want, it comes up into the extraction vessel through the canister and then out through this pipe and then into this back pressure valve. The back pressure valve is what's used to build the pressure. So by this, we can vary the amount that, that, uh, of, of CO2 that can pass through and we can raise the pressure. Uh, this, is a, this is called a lamination valve. Uh, that's the type of valve it is, but its function is a back pressure valve. After it comes out of the back pressure valve, it goes through another heat exchanger because whenever there's a change in pressure, there's a change in temperature, and we want to bring the temperature back to our set point before we go into separator number one. Right. So when we use CO2 and we put in just a little bit of ethanol, that little bit of ethanol expands that CO2 400 times, not 400 percent, 400 times, because it's able to grab the nonpolar and all of the compounds all the way over through to the moderate pole. So that's what we're doing here today. We're trying to get the best of both worlds. The other thing about CO2 is that it's very selective. So while we're going to run an extraction today, where we're uh, pushing the, the process to try to get as much out as we can, we're going to get chlorophyll along with salts and sugars and perfumes and sesame perfumes and cannabinoids and essential oils and God knows what else. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to do because your stated goal is that you wanted to have an extract that came as close to the flower as you could find. Right? And that's what we're trying to do. Exactly. Okay. All right. In a nutshell. In a nutshell. So it's off and running. You can see, yeah, we're, yeah. now we're at the we're pressure, at the you can see right. how we're holding the pressure. We come back to the layout, and we go to the, to the pump. You can see how accurately we hold the flow rate. Yeah. So, this is off and running, and it's set up for about a four hour cycle. going to play Hay Siri. This is the first in a long planned series of Hay Siri. Hey Siri, what's the history of medical marijuana in the state of Maine? So, the answer is that the state of Maine uh, passed the first medical marijuana law in... Hold the drums. Maine has allowed prescribed uh, and limited possession of medical marijuana since 1999. It was the fourth. It was the fourth state to legalize medical marijuana. So, back to the program. Yes. Bill just took a second uh, collection. Sometimes we call it a pull. Um, and because this is a CO2 expanded ethanol extraction, we have a lot of ethanol. Right. We. If in this case, we pumped ethanol for uh, about 5% of the flow for about a half an hour, and it'll continue, continue to come out. And what we want to do is we want to collect all the ethanol that we put in. Typically, we get back more than 99% of the ethanol, and we want to get as much of the cannabinoids and other goodness that the plant has to offer. <clears throat> this will ultimately, when we can finish the, the collection of everything, will go into the, the secondary process. Yeah. 
Yeah, so so welcome back. Glad to be here. Yeah, since you were here last when we finished doing the extraction, <clears throat> we took we took the raw extract, we diluted it with ethanol, mixed it up very, very well, and then we cryo conditioned it for about uh, 24 hours at uh, minus 25 degrees C. During that 24 hours, what happens is the fats and the waxes start to agglomerate and settle. And at that point, when it's finished conditioned, once we've cryo conditioned it, we then filter it. It's typically a two or three step filtering process with different levels of filtering technique. And I usually finish off with about one micron. We then take the defatted, de-waxed uh, solution, and then we remove the ethanol to leave the absolute oil. We do it using a distillation process, okay. and we do it very, very gently, and it takes us probably 10 times longer than, than most people, but we, again, we it's believe we do it gently because we want to try to preserve as much as what's uh, right there. And this is a pen with uh, just a small amount of the extract in it. You can see it's very, very dark. We think that the dark is a sign of that we've got a broad spectrum of everything is there. This particular extract was done using a co-solvent extraction process. So it already had some of the ethanol already in it. And we used that ethanol to help get out a lot more midpolar compounds. And it has a profile that is much closer to the original plant than if you use either just ethanol alone or CO2 alone. And the test report came back, we sent it out for testing, and it's uh, about 65% potency. So that's 65% THC and 35% uh, of the rest of the entourage. And known for decades that THC works better and the CBD works better uh, in conjunction with the whole entourage of compounds. I'm back. Uh, Take a look at this and, and smell that. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it smells right. It smells right. Doesn't yeah, it does. Okay. Nothing burnt. Nothing no. foul. No. Nothing stinky. Sweet. Definitely. Right. Herbal. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's what we're shooting for. Because if you don't, if you don't handle it gently, you can. Create lots of unintended uh, changes in the material, right? Molecular type. Okay. Right. Now, we've done this so gently that this is of uh, the THC comp, it's still about 75% THCA, all right? Mm -hmm. So it really hasn't had a lot of exposure to heat for, for very long. So, first we're going to have you try that. Very smooth, very smooth. Wow, <coughs> what does it taste like? Herb. Mm. Does it taste like White Widow? It does. Uh, uh, I can feel it working. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what else is interesting? Okay. It's 65% and, and, and it can be reasonably powerful, you know, mm -hmm. um, because it has everything else there to help right. it along. Right. It's actually decarboxylating. Most of the decarboxylation is coming just in that final vaporization right, stage. Right. So. 